today we have a, a distinguished professor from uh, South Africa. So Professor uh, Joshua Meyer, the Department of Mechanical and Aeronautical Engineering, University of Pretoria. So uh, before going to start the uh, seminar, so I'd like to briefly introduce him. So uh, Professor Meyer uh, <coughs> graduated from the University of Pretoria in <coughs> 1984, and he got a, a PhD in 1988 in the same university, uh, Department of Mechanical Engineering. After military service, uh, he uh, appointed as an associate professor at the Northwest University in 1990. <coughs> he promoted to the professor in 1991, and in 1994 he uh, moved uh, to the University of uh, Johannesburg. And since uh, 2002, he uh, became a professor of the uh, University of Pretoria. So the head of Department of Mechanical Engineering, now the chair of the School of Engineering, are also the uh, director of the uh, Advanced Engineering Center of Excellence. So his uh, uh, research field is uh, heat transfer, is ma mainly in uh, uh, refrigeration of flow boiling, flow condensations. And uh, he is uh, very international. <coughs> he organized, uh, uh, he uh, initiated uh, the uh, uh, Hilfant conference. Uh, it, will, it is held in every year, just mostly in uh, Africa. And, uh, I had attended uh, several times. <coughs> So today's uh, talk is a heat transfer uh, into transitional flow regime. So let us invite him. Oh, please, let's start. Uh, Professor Takota, uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much also for the invitation, uh, for asking me to, to come here to Kyushu. Uh, I, I am actually on my way to the International Heat Transfer Conference in Kyoto, and I think many of you too. And um, the title is the same as the keynote paper that I'm going to present on Monday, but the content will not be the same. So I'm still working on this paper, and I will I will be adding a lot of material, and actually also taking away a lot of material because today I've got an hour, while on Monday I only have 30 minutes, so I'll have to condense it much more. So uh, what I would like to do is I would just like to give an historical overview of our understanding of transition and uh, what we can get in the recent literature at the moment. And then also maybe give you an example of why transition is important uh, to show to you that it is not only a, a something of interest which doesn't bother us and uh, we do not have to be worried about it. Uh, then. Uh, Obviously, more research is needed, we'll be forward from that. And then I will give you an overview of the state of the art of the recent work that has been done in this field um, of other people and of our group. And then I will also mention some future work that needs to be done, that can be done. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail in that. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can get that in the keynote paper that I will present on, on Monday. Um, just going back into history, we know that Reynolds was actually the first guy who really made a breakthrough, break, breakthrough and, uh, at Manchester University in 1883. And from that, uh, we know that the Reynolds number, which is the ratio of viscous to inertia, inertia forces, is really the parameter that really determines when transition occurs from laminar <coughs> to turbulent flow. But the results of Reynolds wasn't really that practical. The people who first really made it very, very practical for engineers in industry to be to be used as a design tool was Moody and Princeton, Princeton in 1944 uh, with the development of the Moody chart, as we know it, in which they have very clearly identified the laminar to turbulent transition tubes and in which they published the friction factors. Uh, now, the recent literature in terms of what transition is is extremely complex and I'm not, 
and I, I myself don't understand it, and I really do not want to understand it, so I'm not going to go and do the fluid mechanics of it or the most recent transition models, but really more from a practical point of view, what are the most important things that we know about it. And some of the most important things that we know is that it, uh, it is not transition only, do not occur only at one specific Reynolds number, but over a range of Reynolds numbers, from a critical Reynolds number where it starts to somewhere a larger Reynolds number, and that larger Reynolds number is also not very well defined. And in this regime from where it starts to where it ends, the flow alternates between nominal and flow and turbulent flow. And one of the parameters that can be used to identify it or to quantify it is the intermittency fac factor, in which that you can use to at a very specific point determine the fraction of the time that the flow would be turbulent. Now, what is interesting is if we go back into the history of what Reynolds and Raleigh's idea or ideas were of what transition really is, it is still being considered as the state of the art that it is the <coughs> process of transforming a stable laminar flow into an unstable turbulent flow. That is still sort of the best definition of what transition is. <coughs> and uh, there is a characteristic change uh, in transition. Uh, it occurs at local points in the flow regime and the velocities and the pressures at all these points become unstable and randomly fluctuate. And I'm going to show you some examples a little bit later. But as the flow becomes more turbulent, then the velocity distribution, if we just think of a tube, becomes more uniform as a result of the enhanced mixing that occurs because of the turbulent flow. Typical fundamentals that we know is that before transition, the boundary layer thickness is approximately proportional to Reynolds to the minus a half, and the thermal boundary layer directly proportional to Reynolds to the half. Why is that important? Because the transfer coefficient is directly proportional to the thermal boundary layer. Then after transition, things change. The boundary layer thickness now becomes directly proportional to Reynolds to the minus fifth, and the thermal boundary layer becomes directly proportional to Reynolds to the fourth, four fifth. That's typically in a flat plate. Uh, and if we look at literature in our heat transfer books that we prescribed to our undergraduate and our postgraduate students, and in very reputable uh, books and references, ref uh, literature, like the Asherah journals, uh, you know, those thick Bible books that you get, four volumes of them, uh, they all tell you to avoid designing in the transitional flow regime. So they stay away from it. It's still considered as a very complicated process and not fully understood. <coughs> and the problem is it causes this, a discontinuity for design engineers. And again, I'm going to show you examples in that regard. So as you know, I mean, if we just think of the friction factor here as a function of the Reynolds number, this is the laminar flow regime and there is the turbulent flow regime. Now when I started working in this field, I sort of thought that, you know, okay, if I have flow in a tube and I start increasing the Reynolds number, you know, then I'm going to move down this curve with the friction factor, it's going to become lower and lower and lower, and then suddenly your books, there's going to be discontinuity and it's going to jump to that point. And that's why this is such a gray area, you know, there's a discontinuity there. And uh, this is for the graphs, you know, that we provide in almost all the textbooks of heat transfer and in fluid mechanics. While with heat transfer, it is almost something similar. I <coughs> typically know in a, in a tube, if we have a constant heat flux, then the result number is 4.36. If it is forced convection, then if the flow is turbulent, then there are actually many equations that we can choose from. For example, Dickinson, Wilker, and Petikoff, and Dinsky. What is interesting is if you go and plot these equations next to each other, there's a wide spread. If you take the average, then all those equations are plus or minus 20%, which is not really good for design engineers that want to 
compete against each other when they design the equipment. But still, this regime there is not really fully understood, and there's no equations. Obviously, for mixed, equi mixed convection, there's also correlations that describe it here, but they all disappear here. And many of these equations are actually only valid from 10,000 Reynolds number and not lower, and I will also address that issue a little bit later. <coughs> so, what are the practical applications of flow in the transitional flow regime? Well, the answer is it really occurs a lot in industry, typically in concentrated solar power systems, nuclear power, fossil fuel power, almost anywhere where you get a heat exchanger, there is many there are many of them that actually operate in the transitional flow regime. And also blood passing through large arteries uh, in the body. Some of them where there's also heat transfer is actually also in the transitional flow regime. So why do we need to do more research in the transitional flow regime? Well, obviously, firstly, to improve our fundamental understanding of the mechanisms and the effects on heat transfer. Uh, and in my case, without specifically trying to go into turbulence models. Uh, and as you know, more and more designed engineers are designing things using numerical programs or software programs. If you have discontinuities in the equations, it's just not so nice. You, know, you want everything to be smooth. Obviously, we can use if statements. You know, if the Reynolds number is smaller than this, then we use that one. If the Reynolds number is larger, then you can do that. And there are also more and more optimization programs that become available with very, very complicated optimization procedures that not only does the optimization from a heat transfer point of view and a pressure drop point of view, but also from a manufacturing point of view, from maintenance point of view. Optimization programs just become more and more complicated. <coughs> it will also be very good if we can provide these tools so that there's no discontinuity and also so that very accurate information and data can be produced. <coughs> so the purpose of this paper, uh, the <coughs> other reason why flowing the transitional flow regime is so important is that Many heat exchangers are maybe designed, or not maybe in most cases designed, to operate in the turbulent flow regime. The problem with the turbulent flow regime <coughs> is there's a, an order of magnitude increase in the pressure drop from the nominal flow regime to the turbulent flow regime. However, you do not want to go to the nominal flow regime because the heat transfer coefficients are now too low. <coughs> so in many cases, the optimum is in many cases in the transitional flow regime. Many heat exchangers who are designed because of scaling and other effects, you know, because of scaling, the pressure drop starts, starts to, to, to increase, and uh, uh, the result is that the Reynolds numbers start decreasing, and they start operating closer and closer into the transitional flow regime. In many cases, also, there are changes in the design conditions in, in production that causes many heat exchanges to stop operating the transitional flow regime. So the purpose of this, this paper is to review the state of the art of trans the transitional flow regime, to put together the fragmented literature, to discuss it critically, to identify gaps, to give new perspectives, and to recommend future work for some of you who might, who might find this field, field interesting. <coughs> Now, so far, if we look at the state of the art, then it consists out of actually, I think, five parts that can be put together. <coughs> we have all the historical work, the conventional uh, work in terms of convection, uh, heat transfer, and pressure drop, the conventional convection, heat transfer, and pressure drop. Then the JAR and co workers at Oklahoma State University, I think they were actually some of the first people who started doing very systematic work in the transitional flow regime. Then our group also did a lot of coherent research. And then I'm going to address the low Reynolds number. And if we have time, I'm also going to mention some other related work, which might not be so important for, for this paper. Right, so in terms of the, of the, li the literature that is available, if we first look at the conventional work that has been done previously, a large body of work, articles like this, Thick, thick textbooks in which you can get for laminar flow, 
and turbulent flow regimes for forced convection and mixed convection, all the equations that you need. Uh, recent reviews were done by Shaw and London, by Shaw and Paul, together with Burgles and many other people who really did a lot of work in this regard. <coughs> um, <coughs> However, it is clear from their work, and many people, many of the researchers actually point, pointed it out, that <coughs> almost no work has been done in the transitional flow regime, typically Reynolds numbers of 2000 to 2008. Right, good job and co-workers. I think they were the first who really did some of the most, some of the best work in, in, in the flow, in the transitional flow regime, experimental work, where they started looking at the effect of different types of inlet, inlets. Because it has been known for a long time, it is cited in literature that transition in that friction, in that moody chart, in that gray area, the transition is being influenced by the type of inlet, the turbulence intensities, and possible upstream fluctuations. So what they did is they looked at different types of inlets, and they measured the friction factors and the transfer coefficients in the transitional flow regime. They published more than 30 articles, and I'm going to try to give you a very, very short summary of it, and if you're going to look textbook of single in the jar, there's even a short turf summary of it. <coughs> so, the different types of inlets they've used is what is called a re-entrant. Uh, there you can see, you know, that part of the tube which actually goes out one diameter inside the coming section. In this one, which is sort of a square edge, which is the more conventional one, this one is a pell mouth, a very, very rounded uh, inlet. There are not many applications of this in industry, but there are. Those, are. those are examples where there are problems with erosion. <coughs> now, the advantage of this is that we start with a very, very thin boundary layer. You can see the, the results of that a little bit later. So what they did is they investigated those three different types of inlets. And in our group, what we also did is we introduced another one, and that is the so-called hydrodynamically fully developed one. So we would start something like that with a, with a very with a bell mouth, and then we will have a long enough length so that the velocity boundary layer is fully developed before the heating starts. <coughs> and here are some of the some of the results. Um, we can see that there are four sets of results of friction factors, it's a function of Reynolds number, and the differences are firstly isothermal flow, so no heat transfer. Then we start increasing the heat flux to 3 kilowatts per square meter, 8 kilowatts per square meter, and 16 kilowatts per square meter. So if I can just go back and look at this tube here, it is being heat in the form of the constant heat flux. So those are the results. And if we analyze the results, then firstly we can see that the nature of the transition and the behavior clearly depends on the type of inlet that is being used. <coughs> um, the blue is the red entrant. Um, the, the blue, then the square edge, and look at the bell mouth. The bell mouth really, transition is delayed up to about Reynolds numbers of 6,000, and we also did the experiments up to about 10,000 Reynolds number before transition is delayed. And look at the large jump in the friction factor from the laminar flow regime to turbulent and how sharp it is. Right, if we start increasing the heat flux, start heating it, then we see that the range of the transition, if we go and start and look at all the different points where the transition starts and ends, that they are different. <coughs> and also, that in the laminar flow regime, the line is start moving up. And that is because of the secondary flow that becomes stronger and stronger as the heat flux actually increases. But the result of that, all cases is that the transition would start at a different place and in a different place. <coughs> right, in terms of the heat transfer the results, the heat transfer results in this case is being presented according to the Stompton problem number with the J factor, also as a function of the Reynolds number, uh, and also the missile number as a function of the local missile number as the flow develops through the tube. 
you can see that firstly these experiments were done at the heat fluxes that I've mentioned, and there they are, but all of them have secondary flow. Not one of those experiments were from a forced convection situation. It is maybe from an academical point of view, it is not used much, but in any case these experiments are also needed because we would like to see how does the heat transfer, if it follows this line, how does it jump from <coughs> this line up to the turbulent line. But again, we can see that the different types of inlets influence the heat transfer and the transition in the, the transition from nominal to the flow. So that is just a previous graph that I've just marched. <coughs> and then the next one, this graph where we looked at the missile number as a function of uh, sorry, as uh, the distance. And look at how the flow develops. Uh, what is interesting is this specific case of the bell mouth, uh, the missile number would decrease and there's almost a second type of a transition that occurs from there to there and the jar uh, themselves uh, spent one specific paper where they've looked at this very, very interesting case. Uh, what Kajar also did is they did not only look at macro um, um, tubes but also at micro channels but only friction factors, no heat transfer. And what they did is they've looked at the friction factor of 12 different tube diameters. <clears throat> um, not all 12 is plotted there, because otherwise the graph is going to be too busy. But if we look at the friction factors of the different types of diameters, there we can see it's about a one millimeter tube to down to about 0.2, and then it starts becoming smaller. What we see there is that tube diameters are, let's call it, large, then the transition for all the different types of tubes is that the same inlet is about the same. But at the stage, things really start changing. So as the tube diameter becomes smaller, we can see that it really changes. And the reason for that is most probably the relative roughness, uh, the epsilon divided by the diameter effect. Uh, which becomes larger and larger as the tube diameter becomes smaller. And that is most probably the reason why this occurs. Uh, this is only friction factor data. Unfortunately, there's no heat transfer data. Uh, in, in my lab, we are actually not busy with the experiments and we hope to, to, to have those uh, results soon. And then, uh, Jal also looked at microfilm tubes. So that is more practical because in industry, very rarely these days, tubes are being used just as smooth tubes. Enhanced tubes are used. So in the tubes, there are microfins and they are spiraled. And here we can see the friction factor as a function of Reynolds number. And you can really see things are really changing a lot. Uh, there is almost there is what is called by Burgles and other people a second type of a transition. And what they say is, the people who did some work in this regard also look at the heat transfer there. It shows that actually <coughs> with microfins, the, the effect of the, of the fins and the spiral angle actually starts only becoming very effective, typically at those Reynolds numbers. At smaller Reynolds numbers, they are just not effective enough. They do not, they, they, they do not have a large enough effect that they can cause the rotation action while the flow moves in an axial direction. Um, in this case now, for friction factor for different types of inlets, here we can see again how things are changing. Um, those are the smooth tubes there, and there's the microfilm <coughs> tubes. Quite a difference in the results. The J factors, the transfer, it's just the two, two previous graphs that I've enlarged. Here we can see again the smooth tubes and these the microfilm tubes. Okay. Right, so that is now the work of um, of Bijar. Um, I'd like to introduce the work that we have done at our university now over the past um, seven to ten years. And it actually started as an ASHRAE project, the American Society for Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. They've put the project out <coughs> and we were fortunate enough to get it. So what is different with the, reserve, with the work that we did to that of the jar? Well, the very important difference is that 
uh, in air conditioning and refrigeration, as you know, there are always condensers and evaporators. And in those heat exchanges, you always have a constant temperature during condensation or evaporation. So they wanted to know how does, for these types of tubes, how does the type of inlet affect the heat transfer behavior? It is different than the work of the jar who did heating, where we have a constant heat flux. And we know from classical heat transfer that there is a difference. If we just think of the missile number, forced convection, constant wall temperature, it is 3.66, and for constant wall temperature, it's 4.36. There's a difference. So they wanted to know what will happen if there's a constant wall temperature <coughs> and a constant heat flux. So we did cooling and not heating which was a totally different approach than that of the jar. So our work was a bit independent, and the result of it is that in most cases we could actually not compare a lot of our work. What was also different from our work was, was that with the work of the jar, they very specifically <coughs> were interested in, in, in measuring the missile numbers and the friction factors when the flow was fully developed. And when you have uh, like in the air conditioning and refrigeration industry, where you typically use glycols, then in many cases it can almost be 100 meters before the flow is fully developed. And most chillers are not 100 meters in length. Uh, they are constructed typically for bowlings with shorter lengths, typically about 3 to 5 meters. And they wanted to know what is the average heat transfer coefficient and the average friction factor. So our approach was a little bit more practical, but it's, well, it was uh, more relevant to practical design engineers and also very specifically for the air conditioning and refrigeration type of uh, industry. And we also looked at <coughs> different types of inlets. And as I've mentioned, we've int introduced also this type of inlet to see if we have a fully developed velocity profile, what will happen with the transfer and friction factor results. We also, what we did is we investigated the characteristics of smooth tubes, then also enhanced <coughs> tubes. We also looked at nanofluids. We used a multi-wall carbon nanotube, uh, typically with uh, diameters of 10 to 20 nanometers, very long lengths of 10 to 30 micrometers, which means that the aspect ratio of the carbon nanotubes was about 1,000. So if you look at it under the same, it looks like spaghetti. And I was very interested, interested in, to know how this spaghetti now behaves from the nominal flow regime to the turbulent flow regime. I was hoping that it would change dramatically and that all the spaghetti will help to actually move the, the heat from the fluid to the wall and actually help with the heat transfer process. Uh, we obviously we also looked at it uh, with different concentrations from 0 to 1%. And then we also investigated the hysteresis effect of transitions. So if you have nominal flow and you go to turbulent, then there will be a certain characteristic, as I've shown previously. And all the experiments up to then was done only from nominal flow and increasing it to turbulent flow. But the question was that I mean, if you have turbulent flow and you come back, will the transition be exactly the same? <coughs> And then we also investigated, as I've mentioned, in the transition flow regime, it is mentioned in literature, all these fluctuations that you get. And we would like, we wanted to measure the friction factor fluctuations and the missile number fluctuations as a function of time. Right, so here are the results for typically a smooth tube. And as you can see, as I've mentioned previously, all the different types of inlets, the behaviors are different. This is firstly for isothermal. And there we can see the bell mouth, almost 8,000 before transition occurs. But the transition is very much different than that of the jar. It actually, there's a transition, and then it goes down, and then there's almost a second transition again, which is a, a very strange, and uh, we do not really know what the reason is for that. If we now heat it, we can see that there's obviously a significant increase, oh sorry, if we cool it, there's an obviously an increase in the friction factor, it's not because of the viscosity on the wall that changes, that contribution is only 4%, it's because of the secondary <coughs> flow. But look at the mess here in terms of how the flow changes from one to turbulent, and how they, from there on, all of them converge 
almost to where they all stumbled, uh, where all of them starts going to the turbulent flow regimes at the turbulent at where they all stumbled off about 10,000. Uh, the previous group was for water, then we've looked at glycol, and look at the results here in terms of the transfer coefficients. There's water, and here's glycol. So what's interesting is that if you have water, then the transition behavior for all of them are actually the same. And the type of inlet doesn't matter. It's very, very important thing. The type of inlet doesn't matter. Yeah, but, and the transition, as you can see, is very, very smooth. However, if the primal number is increased, I think our primal number was increased by about three times. So this was about six, seven, and this was about 20 to 30. You can see that the behavior are very, very much different. Huge transitions from long enough to turbulent, big jumps, and very, very different. This is important for the air conditioning and filtration engineers because many of the chillers are using glycol and not water on the inside. <clears throat> then enhanced tubes. We looked at um, enhanced tubes, which are being used in the chiller industry. Typically about uh, 15 millimeters, 25 fins of about 0.4 millimeters, spiraled at 25 degrees, and we measured the friction factors for um, <coughs> the thermal case. And here there you can see the friction factors, the transition, and there the secondary transition that, that was picked up by other researchers. They say it is only there when the enhanced tube becomes starts becoming very efficient. Not a trans numbers lower than that. Also for an enhanced tube now with heat transfer, so without heat transfer to with heat transfer, so it really changes a lot. Uh, the characteristics there for the different types of tubes. Uh, take note of the one that we've put in there, the fully developed one. As I've mentioned, we've got a fully developed velocity profile. Before we start with the cooling of the Tube. Um, the J factors, the transfer coefficients, um, very much different than that for a smooth tube. And then for nanofluids, nanofluids, look at the friction factors now. I've mentioned about the fact that I was hoping this spaghetti was really going to change stuff, and it really did. Uh, the blue line is for water, you can see it. And uh, this was for a, a, a smaller binary <coughs> tube, so it wasn't for the same binary tube that, that we've done previously. And it was also not for fully developed flow, it was just about, about a one meter uh, tube. And here we can see as the concentration of the water is being increased, as the number of is, uh, as it is added, that the friction factor actually decreases. And the reason for that is the viscosity that changed. But again, we can see that the transition behaviors are much different. And after transition, all of them very quickly follows the turbulent flow regime line. Um, then, the missile numbers. The missile number is a function of Reynolds number. <coughs> For there's the water, and we can see as we increase the concentration of the nanofluids, that things change. In the nominal flow regime doesn't help to use carbon nanotubes at all. Okay. The turbulent flow regime, just by adding 1% of carbon nanotubes, the transfer coefficient can, the missile number can be increased by about 25%. But again, the missile number behaviors are not the same. Um, <coughs> if you work, and I think many of you do work in a, do work with nanofluids, um, and you work in forced convection, then you will know that uh, this comparison is problematic for many people uh, because as you add the carbon nanotubes, as I've mentioned, the, the, the physical properties of the nanofluid change so much that it is very difficult to compare. And in many cases, the heat transfer coefficient is actually compared to the average velocity. And if you use that as a comparison, then actually the heat transfer coefficients decrease. But the thermal conductivity increase much more with when you add the carbon nanotubes. <coughs> there are many, many papers with different criteria that, that has been published. 
that, that, that takes into consideration not only the heat transfer enhancement, but also the pressure drops to use some of these criteria as tools to really make decisions if it is really worthwhile to add the carbon nanotubes or not. And I'm not a specialist in that regard, but lots and lots of papers have been published on it. Then, as I've mentioned, the hysteresis effect. The hysteresis in terms of if we actually increase the Reynolds number in blue and then decrease it in red. Uh, there's more than 300 data points here. It's been taken very, very, very carefully. And you can see there is a difference, but it is within the uncertainty of our measurements. So, so far we cannot really say that there is a transition effect, but if it is, then it is very small. So at least we know that. <clears throat> These are some of the results that we took of how things changes during the transitional flow regime. So this is um, the changes in the friction factor, the standard deviation in the changes of the friction factor. So this is what the set represents as a function of the Reynolds number. So it's a very busy graph. Okay. And what is different from this graph and this graph is the tube diameter. So two different tubes that has been tested. So let me first explain this one. So the standard deviation, so that is how much fluctuations there is in the friction factor when we take measurements. So that is what the graph actually tells us. There's the uh, Reynolds number, and here we can see the different types of inlets. So if we look at the square edge in blue, we can see that there's no fluctuations in the friction factor, but then suddenly there, there's a big change in the friction factor, and then suddenly all the fluctuations disappears. For the fully developed one, it's very different, and the re-entrant one. Okay. The square edge, where that one is, very, very different than that of the other. others, while the bell mouth, very naughty one, look at that one, jumps up there, the high Reynolds number, and very, very large fluctuations in the friction factor, and then it disappears. But this is just an enlargement of this, of this area here, to see what actually happens there. So we can see that the type of inlet will also influence how large the pressure drop fluctuations will be in the transitional flow region. <coughs> that is from the 15 millimeter tube or almost a 16 millimeter tube to a tube not much larger, just from 15 to 19. But these two tubes are the two tubes who are used most in the air conditioning and refrigeration industry. That is why we've did the experiments. And again, we can see that the different types of inmates behave differently. Look at the bowel mouth in this case, what it does. Uh, not so, not such large jumps, but then there are two of them again. <coughs> and here again, we can see <coughs> how other fluctuations changes for the different types of inmates. With the heat transfer, the previous work was without the previous graphs, or without heat transfer, so it was just the friction factors. Now, with the heat transfer, if we take the heat transfer measurements, then that is what happens. Uh, you would remember that for water, all of the results were lying on top of each other. And those are the results there. So that is not for the climate, or but just for water. So we can see that the transition behavior is not much different. But here for the large tube, things are much different. What is the reason for, we think, for the differences between the two tube diameters? We think that the reason is that the calming section that we used were the same for both of them. So the contraction ratio for the two bell mouth tubes and the other inlets were not exactly the same. And maybe that is the reason for that. Uh, that can obviously just be verified. If somebody would go and do those experiments using the exact same contraction ratios. <clears throat> right, in terms of the low Reynolds number in to work, that is also of very, very important. Uh, all the work that we've done up to now were actually concentrating on this area. So as you can see, here's the missile number as a function of Reynolds number. And what I did there is I've plotted three different Prandtl numbers typically of air, water, and uh, a high concentration of glycol. And 
if you don't look at the literature, the most modern equations, then that is what you can get. So the nominal flow regime, that, that's the results. Then for turbulent day, for high problem numbers, and you can see the discontinuities in the equations. Things are not connected. Now with the work that we've done, surely it can help connecting the flow regime from nominal to turbulent. But another flow regime that is also very problematic is what is called the low Reynolds number end. The low Reynolds number end <coughs> has been picked up from the beginning by uh, even people before Glinsky that uh, all the equations of Glinsky and Petapov, all of them are actually following a straight line if you on a lock lock scale, if you would go and plot it, would follow a straight line with Reynolds numbers of 10,000 and larger. So if you go and look at those equations, all of them would be valid, most of them would be valid for Reynolds numbers of 10,000 and larger. But from 10,000 and lower, from there, to just after transition, <coughs> that area is called the low Reynolds number in regime. And only recently, people like Abram have started working in this regime, taking measurements there and developing equations, and Glinsky also. However, so far, what they actually only do is they are connecting the end of transition to that line. So all the effort is there. However, uh, they are doing it without taking into consideration what that Reynolds number is at the end of transition. Uh, and, 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 and we and then will have to work together so that we can have a smooth connection from the long hour through transition <coughs> and also through the lower Reynolds number end up to the Reynolds number of 10,000. If you can go and read through your heat transfer textbooks very, very carefully, most of them, most of the authors will tell you fully turbulent flow is only Reynolds numbers of 10,000 and larger. Okay, so the lower Reynolds number end from 10,000 up to just after transition, most equations do not hold in that that flow regime. Okay, then a lot of other work has been done, well not a lot, but some work has also been done in other passages with salt and um, uh, salt, salt and salt has been considered and a little bit in channels. But again, not really in a fully transitional flow regime. Just close to it, but not really quantifying it, and also not taking into effect the type of inlet we know the type of unit has a huge influence on how the transition behaves. So in terms of future work, um, uh, in the paper that I'm presenting in Kyushu, uh, there are 13 topics that I've identified for PhD students as PhD topics. Okay. And the first one of them is to look at the inlet effects of the calming sections. Uh, the calming section that we have used is used is based on the one that Kajar used. Kajar used one that was sort of based a bit on people who did some wind tunnel work. But there's no it's not there's no engineering science in it. It's just, you know, you use half of the others, but you do not really know why. There are lots of screens in it and there are, you know, these straws in it, but no measurement of what the inlet turbulence is before uh, you know, at the inlets of all the work that we did. So uh, I think there's a lot of potential for somebody that can go and look at calming sections to measure the different types of inlets, the turbulence intensities that can be generated, and then again to look at the effect of that also on transition. So that also needs to be done. Uh, <coughs> What we are doing is, I actually do have a PhD student that starts working on this, and what we're doing is we are building one of these calming sections and we're actually putting in a propeller in it and with a hot wire afterwards so that we can actually measure the turbulence intensities. And we are just at the stage where we start buying the, uh, the thing that we can buy, the, that we can measure the, the velocities with. Uh, so it is still a, 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 a research in, in progress at this stage. Then upstream vibrations and pulses. I didn't have time to show you our experimental setup. But in our experimental setup, we've, before our calming section, we've included thick accumulators. 
so that we can dump all the fluctuations of the pumps. So that the pressure is very, very constant. Um, if you have a pump upstream, the pulsations of that most probably might also have an effect on how the transition behaves. Uh, then, with the types of inlets that we have considered, not many of them are really that practical. If you go and look at a big shoving tube heat exchanger with all these thousands of tubes coming out, uh, the type of re-entrant that we have manufactured for our experiments are not really what you will find in industry. In industry, it's a little bit rough on the outside, and <coughs> somebody will also have to go and, and, and look at that. Then, tube bundles in shuttle tube heat exchangers. There are thousands of tubes, and in many cases, the distance between them is specified typically in the TMA. And it says you shouldn't go uh, nearer than 1.5 diameters from each other. So many shallow tube heat exchangers are designed with a pitch of about 1.5 and larger. But we do not know what the effect is if we have all these different types of inlets together because the, the tubes next to the all the tubes are going to influence <coughs> the type of flow behavior or flow effects that, that we will get in, in chillers. Uh, but it's not only the pitch that is important, it is also the geometry of how the pitch is packed because there are so-called triangular pitches and uh, you, can, you can distribute the, you know, all the tubes in the triangular type of way or a square type of way. Uh, there are hundreds of them actually and, and those effects also need to be studied. Uh, then also tube inserts. Uh, you might know that in many chillers, especially when glycol has been used, that uh, there are twisted pipes which are being put on the inside. Uh, because specifically with glycol, uh, the Reynolds numbers on the nominal flow of the tube, or again in the transitional flow of the tube, uh, that work also needs to be done. Uh, there are several more projects <coughs> which, is, which is in my so if you if you're interested, please let me know, and I can forward it to you. And uh, you're very welcome uh, to to look at that. If you would also like to see what are the other ones that uh, that I'm proposing, because I'm seeing I'm running out of time, or I thought I'm going to run out of time. I've I've stopped all the future work at, at this point. Uh, so to conclude, uh, Professor Takata, I think that. Um, Many heat exchangers operate closer into the transitional flow of the gym. So it is really a, a practical problem for many engineers and they want tools so that they can solve the heat transfer or know what the heat transfer is going to be and the friction factors and they want it very accurately. Uh, we spoke uh, over lunch about the fact that many people say heat transfer is mature. Uh, if we look at the equations of Glinsky, uh, uh, those equations were developed using the data of Sidel and Tate and other people before them. And at that stage, I mean, temperatures were measured with thermo thermometers, and they, do not have, they didn't have the, the very accurate instrumentation that we have today. They also, at that stage, I mean, you could publish a, a paper on experimental work without, uh, the, without determining what the uncertainties are because the uncertainty analysis method wasn't known at that stage. So the uncertainties of those equations are not known. Even those equations, somebody needs to go and really very, very accurately go and really measure that and develop more accurate um, equations for us so that engineers can really design things and they know they can be very, very competitive against uh, the competition. <coughs> So I think with that, um, I've also given you a state of the art in terms of you know, what we know. I've tried to put it uh, together and showed you some of the gaps and, and, and work that still needs to be done. And I've also identified some, some future work. Uh, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you for, for attending my, my talk. And uh, if Professor Takata allows me, I would, be, um, I would, um, I would welcome any questions. And, Try to answer them if I can.